Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful that we have this chance to be with you and share this communion with you with our brothers. Thank you so much that we have this opportunity and the technology that makes it possible. And we pray as that we talk together that Holy Spirit, you would come and teach us. We would understand more about uh, the wonderful God that we worship and that Lord Jesus is our high priest that you lead us to worship. Pray now that you direct this time together. We commit it to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ted. So, Amen. Bryden, tell us a little bit of your life story. You are not a boring person. You have a journey <laughs> that you've know. taken. So, take us a little bit on that journey, you know, where you grew up, how you engaged theology and you know went on to become both a, a priest as well as an academic in your own right and then an author which we'll we'll pick up at the end of that but tell us a little bit of your story well um i'm in my seven early 70s now so you know that's where we are and and it's been i'm beginning to realize I, I'm, I'm a bit slow at times marty you know just a little slow some of my friends would say brighton don't be stupid <laughs> At 70 you're supposed to Which be is slow, a, have permission to slow down a little bit i think yeah it's, it's great but um a very very rich life actually to be honest um my parents and grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents come from various quarters of the world uh and settled in australasia but also uh, my parents decided after the birth of their third child to set up camp in England in 1955. So although I myself literally went round the world twice on board ships huh. before I was four and a half. Um, yeah, it, it, very interesting. And I'll, I'll come to that as to why. We set up camp in UK between 55 and 77. Those are and that was- ships. Were they Sorry? big ships? Big ships? Oh, I mean, yes, yes. Uh, the New Zealand shipping line, in fact, the Rangi Tiki and the Rangi Tata were okay. the two boats I, I went on board, one older than the other. I had my fourth birthday on board ship between the Panama Canal and Auckland. Huh. And you cross the date line and you do various pagan ceremonies. And 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 it's really fabulous fun. I had my birthday on board ship. We had the captain's table, 34 children uh, at a 4.30 high tea. And I mean, I, I'm sorry, I have this memory. And, 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 and there we old. were. Four years old, we, we, were, we were having a gas at the captain's table. <laughs> mm. I mean, you know, oh boy. Um, but yes, um, my parents married in 47 after the war. The war delayed a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, he was a Anzac fellow, New Zealand artillery anti-tank, captured before mm. El Alamein. Uh, my mother was a WAF uh, in England. Again, how she finished up there is, you know, my grandparents moved from Christchurch to England in 37. Mm. He, he knew war was coming. So he yeah. needed to be in the UK for business purposes. And um, they, they exported meat and wool from New Zealand and Australia into Mother England, quote unquote. Huh. And they've been doing that from before the First World War and were continuing to do it during the second. So things were pretty vital for them anyway. Yeah. And so they married after the se uh, Second World War and they thought, well, we want to do our own thing. And they picked a piece of pink on the map, you know, the world at that stage with pink in here and there. Sorry, sorry, I know. I know you guys left in 1776. You know, that's fine. We we forgive you. <laughs> I've been having you, a party actually. ever since. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. No, come on. Well, you got a few problems. And I mean, George III problems. was not a few problems. George III was perhaps not the nicest man. Um, <laughs> and as we all know, there's a bit, bit of a backstory to his to his sanity. Um they settled in Southern Rhodesia, which was a self-governing colony at that point. Mm -hmm. But then in 53, it became the Federation of New Zealand, of uh, the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Northern Rhodesia, Nyasaland, Southern Rhodesia. Now that is now Zambia is Northern Rhodesia, 
Malawi is Nyasaland, and Zimbabwe, 1980, is um, uh, Southern Rhodesia. And I was brought up in UK, schooled in UK, as I've intimated, and um, also holidayed fairly often in, in, in Rhodesia, as it became known after the independence of the other two places. Undergraduate at the University College of Rhodesia, which was a college of London, um, fabulous education, schooled in UK at a funny little school that you've possibly heard of, gentlemen, uh, Winchester College, founded in 1382. <laughs> I mean, what a gift. I mean, yeah. seriously, 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 what a gift. You know, I mean, unique. Um, I've just listened to Willie Jennings. You know, you know the famous, infamous Willie Jennings? I know Willie, yeah. Uh... Um, he comes to park I, gonna, sometimes. I I I I I won't I won't um, be digressed, but his view of education, I have to quietly say, I do not recognize one iota of it. Huh. Um, it's not my experience of my secondary school. It's not my experience of University College of London and in Zimbabwe, etc. Uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. The education. Um, at the University College of London, UCR, was fascinating because I'm a whitey, okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm surrounded by black students in a multi-racial island in Ian Smith's Rhodesia. And the war hasn't started quite in 1970. It got going in about 73. And, 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 and the civil war I'm talking about. And I had black friends. Mm. I mean, seriously. So one of my problems, Marty, is I don't really understand racism. I mean, of course I do. Mm. Sorry, of course I do. But, you know, um, I'm looking at a black friend and I just don't see his blackness. Yeah. And, and that was a fabulous education in itself. Mm. The best thing that happened to me at university uh, as an undergraduate there was a university Christian mission led by a man called Peter Hall, who became um, an interesting clergyman back in England. He was in St. Martin's in the Bull Ring in Birmingham. And then he became the uh, Bishop of Woolwich, which is part of the London Diocese. And I mean, he's dead now, but he was very instrumental in getting me across the line, shall we say, because I was a bit of a, I don't know what I was, you know? 1960s product. Um, you were fun. Far too, I, I was far too precocious. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was. I was dangerously fun, Marty. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I now believe that. Mein Freund. Yeah, not too lick, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was great fun. Um, and over six months, you know, yeah, Jesus is a good guy. Jesus has taught us many things. He probably founded a church. But what is this knowing him stuff? Mm. I mean, come on, you know. How old were you at that oh, point? I was uh, 19. 19. Okay, well, that's a great point 19. to ask those questions. Oh, look. And, and, and the question gets thrown back at me. I mean, which is how it's always done. Yeah. What about the resurrection? So I'm going, huh? <laughs> and that was about a four to six months pilgrimage of historical inquiry. Um, probability, evidence, what constitutes evidence, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then this is where perhaps Torrance even sort of slips in totally unwittingly, because I did sciences at school, but also languages. And it was always a bit difficult where I sat I was reading economics and law at the time. And anyway, you set up a crucial experiment, don't you? Mm. There's a hypothesis. It's called resurrection. Because if Jesus is raised, he's contactable. Right. More than that, he talks back. Mm. Seriously. Yeah. Talks back. And, 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 and so you set up a series of you know, crucial experiments, because that's what they are. Hello, 
you know, is, is there a ceiling or is there something beyond the ceiling? Yeah. So after six months, I was, I was hook, line and sinker and landed mm -hmm. um, in the most beautifully gentle, sublime way and changed to political science and theology, again, mm -hmm. precociously. That was my degree in the end. The theology was more religious studies than, the, the, than what you and I would call theology. And, and that's the nature of Western university life, uh, which I now know. You said about. it was gentle and sublime. I mean, you, you heard the voice. Somehow God's address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, it, God slips in, you know, doesn't yeah. he? Well, in my case. He kind of slipped in and took up residence before I even knew anybody was there. Mm. And, and, and there's a sense in which he is present. I mean, yes, the famous, famous, famous God is more interior to us than we are to ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. confessions, which when I met in the English and then got hold of the Latin. Uh, sorry, we did Greek and Latin at school and you just kind of had no choice, you know. <laughs> I wish that I had Latin, so there's nothing to apologize. Um, the West well, I mean, I was, becoming... just, I was just an English schoolboy, and that was that. Yeah. Um, but that's true. Sorry, it's true. Utterly. Yeah. Hen hence the poem I try and write at the end of The Lion, the Dove, and the Lamb, you know? Crazy poem, crazy poem. Well, look at that a bit, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there we are. Um, at the end of my undergraduate degree, I felt, okay, now what do we do? The opportunity to go back into meat and wool and farming and all the rest of it is there. Mm -hmm. But Lord, what do you want? What do you want? Yeah. And um, I applied to Wycliffe Hall in Oxford. They were running an interesting thing called a Certificate in Theology, which was sponsored by the Faculty of Theology, Department of Theology, coordinated by the Theological Colleges for Ordinance, specifically tailor-made for us. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just the, you know, God, creation, salvation, man stuff yeah. that the school's program was doing. We had to do church history and liturgy and moral theology and terrible things hmm. like that, you know. <laughs> and I mean, yes. we were blessed. Come on, come on, come on. Um, you know the name Oliver O'Donovan, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, Ollie, as we called him, he's in the flat at the bottom of the of the block of flats that I'm living in. Hmm. Why is that significant? One story from my time there. We're doing quote unquote Isaiah one to twelve, you know, as you as you do. Introduction to Old Testament. Get your teeth into this. And I'm up to chapter 10. Now, chapter 10 is about Babylon knocking the blazes out of Israel. And 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 I'm going, well, Idi Amin has just killed Janani Labum. I'm 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 going back to a guerrilla war. I'm not too sure about this stuff, Lord. <laughs> it's all very well reading about it, but you're, you know, when you're in the middle of it in the continent of Africa, yeah. it's just a bit too real, too real. So at half past nine, I, I, I stopped my work on Isaiah and I toddle down the stairs and I knock on Ollie's door. And I say, and, he, and he's gracious, he's, he's working, but he says, oh, Bryden, what can I do? And I say, I've got a bit of a problem. And I mean, he's, he's been lecturing me theology and moral theology, and we know each other. He just come, come in. So I, in a couple of minutes, I tell him, Janani, the womb, guerrilla war. He goes, oh, have a cup of cocoa. <laughs> <coughs> you know, a cup of cocoa is going to fix everything, isn't it? Uh-huh. And, and an hour later, half past 10, I leave him. We both need to sleep after all. You know, I have to get up at seven o'clock to go to chapel. That's terrible. And <laughs> um, 
that was my first experience of, of ordination training and, and, and theology mm. and stuff. Very human, very yes. interactive, uh, very real. And I was ordained in 77, uh, curate for two and a quarter years. Uh, then the bishop says, Paul Burrow says, now, Bryden, go and do what you're supposed to be doing, which is being a vicar. So in February 1980, I start in my own parish in the other side of Harare. And independence is April 1980. And I mean, what a ride. What a ride. I mean, I can tell you stories that would finish your hair going my color, and I'm not going to do that. Because it's a war. It's a civil war. and It's, it's gross. Mm. It's grotesque. Yeah. But also it's full of miracles. It's full of beautiful encounters. And as a nun once told me, you know, Zimbabwe is a very thin place spiritually. Mm. In other words, stuff breaks through from every side all the time. Yeah. That's true. It's true. I mean, I don't understand the charismatic movement. Oh, of course I do. Sorry. You know, Fountain Trust, Tom Smale, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, but because Africa is, is, is ipso facto charismatic in every dimension, mm. goodies and baddies, left, right, and center. And, 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 and re-enchantment in the West is a bit of a cute idea, really. I mean, come mm. on, guys. Hello, you know, <laughs> are you there? <laughs> oh, boy. So, yeah, so when you throw that paper at me of Tom Smale and, and, and Tom Torrance, I'm going, oh, yes. all right, let's see you what we can do here. Yes. There we go. There we go. There we go. Yeah. And why well, did you a, pursue that's Episcopalian? A why did you pursue Episcopalians <clears throat> versus someone else? Good question. I mean, I'm indoctrinated as a Church of England schoolboy. Don't forget that. I see. Deep but also, the I mean, roots. But I'm also inoculated. Did you hear that one? I'm I inoculated. Did. And I mean, when you go to chapel and you have prayers and you have all that stuff, and I mean, I knew the prayer of, you know, the colic for purity that we start with. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, et cetera, et cetera. I knew that off by heart by the age of nine. Hmm. I prayed it every night for, for, for years. So the spirit was doing something. Yeah before I decided to do something else. And, right. and, and, and I guess age 15, I was confirmed and kicked the religious habit age 16 for another four, four, four or five years, you see. Mm. But the Church of England, you use the word Episcopalian. Yeah, I understand your Scottish roots and all the stuff. You know. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I thought that was um, on your book. Let's see. Oh, it's Anglican priest. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I use the word yeah. Anglican. It's a bit more generic. Um, I mean, with the greatest respect to the Episcopalians as you currently configure themselves, and they have a general convention just the other day, and they're having Lambeth as we speak, and I'm going, Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. They're stuffed. That, and that's being polite. Sorry. Oops. Yeah. There are some very good men and women. Yeah, I've met them. I know them. But as an institution, it is absolutely up a gum tree. Sorry. I don't have gum trees here, so it couldn't be up one. Anyway. <laughs> it's a lovely euphemism that basically says they're up a yes. creek without a paddle. Yes, we have lots of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Leaking coracles. Yes. Oh, boy. So, so there you are. To, I mean, that's... So that's talk the, about going to a study with Alistair McGrath and your the work that you did at, at that higher level, the expansion of your well, brain. Okay. It's, it's 1985. Our family and so on are preparing to emigrate from Zimbabwe for lots of reasons. And I'm caught up in all of that. And I'm going, oh... All right, what does that mean? Do I buck it this way and stay? That's going to be difficult for lots of reasons, which I won't elaborate. So I said, well, let's take a sabbatical. Now, Michael Green is passing through Zimbabwe. I mean, Providence is this weirdest thing. Mm -hmm. 
I've met Michael already anyway, for various reasons. And I say, Michael, you know, I've got a sabbatical possibility coming up. What do you recommend? Oh, well, Wycliffe are just doing post-grad work. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. This is February 1985. So, so and there's a bloke there called Alistair McGrath. Um, you know, he can be a great supervisor. I mean, I didn't know him from Adam. I'm just, I'm from Hicksville, but remember? Zimbabwe's Hicksville. And, 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 and um, so I apply, and then she's sure. Come and do an MPhil with us, you see. So I arrive and I prepare a five-page, you know, resume of what I think I might want to explore. And I go and see this man, Alistair, who looks so young and fresh-faced. I mean, you know, dear me, bless his cotton socks. Well done, today. And 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 and. JL scored all as an equal opportunity employer. Oh, that's, oh, that's Todd. That's Todd talking. <laughs> that's quite funny. Don't worry. I'll just carry on. Carry and, on. And, um, yeah, and he reads my, my five pager. Probably it, 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 in less than 30 seconds. And I ask him a question about page four, just kind of checking up on the, you know, checking up on the man. And he goes, this looks quite Quite promising, Brian. Good. When do you want to start? So I said, well, God, I've got nowhere to live yet. I've got a wife and two children at that point, and, 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 and we're commuting from Petersfield. <laughs> now, that's that's south by two hours along English roads. It's a long ways. Anyway, we find a place, we we find a place to live. And as I say in my acknowledgments, it basically took me a full year. <clears throat> to actually go beyond 30 minutes with Alistair mm. because I just dried up. I mean, you know, come on. He is, at even at that stage, uh, just, just, just a fount of stuff already, you see. I mean, he's a polymath. He's a total polymath. Um, one of these things where the dear good Lord kind of says, okay, let's, let's see what we can create today, you know? And I mean, whoa. He just broke the mold, and, and that was that. Yeah. I mean, I will tell one story, and this is not against him. It's not against him at all. Bless him. We have two children. They have two children, Paul and Lizzie. And so I said, hey, come for dinner. So, I mean, I've, I've been there a year now, and I've gone from an infill to a doctorate. And he says, um, Bryden, we need to get a babysitter. I said, okay, sure, sure, you know. Now, we in our little village north of Oxford, we've got three babysitters already, but that's fine. <laughs> so a couple of weeks, how's, how's the babysitting going? Oh, well, Joanna's sister, wife's sister, um, can't come on, on the day they're recommending. Long story short, they came for high tea on Saturday afternoon with their children. And, and, and it taught me a wonderful lesson because I had dinner with them when Kathy went back to Zimbabwe. And dear Alistair, he is such, I mean, he's changing now because he's been out and around a bit. But this absolute genius was finding social stuff difficult. Huh. And what married couple with two children aged, you know, five and, and, and three don't have babysitters? You know, uh, come on, you know, it's life. It's called life. Yeah. Uh, it's called eating, you know. Um, and dear, dear, dear man. Oh, I, I, I've got to get a babysitter. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, Joanna's sister can't come from London that day. I'm going, oh, tick, tick, tick. You know, the wheels are starting to turn here. And I mean, your, your other work, you, I mean, you've got about five selves, I would imagine, Marty. I, I've, I've looked at the blurb of your three books. And I'm going, oh, goodness me, more, more stuff to buy and read. Yes. Um, you know, but I mean, it's, we are interesting creatures. And when you have a man, dear man, like Alistair, I mean, he is so beautiful. He mm. came to stay in Australia for a while in the 1990s, did a preaching course at Ridley College, Melbourne. And of course, what did I do? I said, okay, I'm going to lasso you and take you to the real Australia. 
And so we got in the car on a Friday, crack of dawn, and we drove north five hours to a station we still owned in the family at that stage. It's now a New South Wales state park, so everybody can go and visit. So that's another story. That's how that, well, how and why that happened. And we were there for a couple of nights. And the assistant manager's Aboriginal man, sorry, back to racism. I mean, he's an Aboriginal man. He grew up on the place. He knew it better than I did. Yeah. Big, big property. And, and, and we're out for lunch and we're boiling billies for tea and eating this and eating that. And this lovely man is like a child watching emus and kangaroos and life in this bush. Yeah. With gum trees and, and, and plains and red dirt. And, oh, did we have fun. Oh, man. All thanks to dear, to dear, uh, the dear assistant manager. Uh, yeah. His name's Bez Murray. I mean, he's dead now. Uh, dear Bez. Beautiful, beautiful Aboriginal man. Totally 100% Aboriginal. Couldn't stand half of his relatives because they were too idle. He says, come on, you need to get out of the sun and work. <laughs> oh, yes. And he can say that, study? I can't. What did you study with Alistair? I mean, what was the, what was the question that you're answering that, that Alistair helped guide you through for your doctoral work? First of all, I had to get my head around a few people. Okay. Karl Barth, Eberhard Jungel. Um, I introduced him actually to Robert Jensen because I'd mm. come across Robert Jensen in ha, ha, Harare of all places, the triune identity in a bookshelf of Mambo Press on a Monday, my day off. There it is. I'm going, oh, this looks a bit cute. Oh, I remember that name. Colin Gunton quotes him in his doctorate being in Becoming. Ah, you know, sorry, this is the crazy brain that sits on top of the shoulders here. And I thought, right. So Jensen, Moltmann, Casper. So those were the 1980s, you know. Um, so getting my head around that, chapters one and two. Chapter three was trying to pull it together a bit. So we looked at three things effectively, which is God and freedom, God and history, God and suffering. Mm. Those were the three themes I took out of all that stuff trying to kind of say, well, okay, now, now, you know, what does it do if you pull these themes out? How do you integrate them or, or what happens? And chapter four was basically this idiot saying, well, here's a new model that might assist us, uh, which is how I start the lamb, the dove and the lamb with the model and the little story and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm a parish priest, right? Okay. And I'm- You're more than I'm that, a, but that's one of the things that you are. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to run confirmation classes for teenagers and adult confirmands and so on. And I mean, what is Trinity? This is a crazy, stupid idea. Come on, come on. It really is. It's daft. But you have to get under the skin of the thing. And getting under the skin of the thing, and I hope that's what I've achieved, you know? As you get under the skin of the thing, it's about an encounter and a series of encounters and the pattern that is traced in give a gift recipient, hence the far side story, hence the model. And chapter four uh, was a little bit of actually my now chapter nine in The Lion, the Dove and the Lamb. I've tweaked it a bit. And chapter 10 in The Lion, the Dove and the Lamb is something totally new. It's, I, I wrote it fresh. Hmm. So chapter four was bigger than chapter nine. And, 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 and you, you kind of tying this together with the three themes of freedom, history, and suffering. Does it work? Well, yes, it works. Every model is imperfect, inadequate. That's why we have at least two models to understand how light behaves. And that's just light. Um, and, and as Michael Green once beautifully put it, um, the atonement is a multifaceted, wonder that was his metaphor a multifaceted wonder mm -hmm. uh, so if that's atonement and you can't actually come up with any controlling narrative you can try justification by grace penal substitution you know come on you know it 
So you have these, these, these crystals, Victor, Anselm, and you know, all this stuff. And, and, and you have the Trinity kind of undergirding all this, issuing this, you know, issuing it. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, 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 and you're trying to teach this stuff. You're trying to preach it from the pulpit. And I have a few diagrams and games I used to play. And this is, this is modalism. And you can't do that because, because, and, and it, it, it works. People get it. People get it. They get it. Give a gift recipient. They get it. It's not everything. It's yeah. something. There you go. Okay. It's and, something. And you, are you, you're still a parish priest. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm retired. Okay. And this is, and this is the moment of confession. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of confession. You probably feel. You're in the confessional. Go for it. Um, I actually handed in my license to the diocesan really? uh, bishop, who, who's a friend of mine. But I got really embroiled with the hierarchy here, and I wrote to this commission and was interviewed by that commission and debated at synods, and because. We have this crazy situation in the Anglican Church of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Polynesia. Okay, mm -hmm. it's our province. Where, on the one hand, we say that we can bless gay and lesbian couples, and on the other hand, we can have legitimately a fellowship, a society of St. Mark, where people can freeze in time, because that's what it is, the General Synod's decision of 2018, uh, where we will allow these blessings to occur, and you folk can still actually believe what you can believe about homoeroticism, and hear the distinction, please, homoeroticism being a sin, it's mm -hmm. sinful human behavior. And, and, and so I'm kind of going, and we've been debating this since 2012. In fact, a lot, a lot earlier, actually, since the 1990s. And I was one of David Coles's uh, examining chaplains and so on. So, I mean, I'm, I was in on the ground floor with Windsor reports and all that stuff. I don't know if you guys are up to Windsor report. It was an, it was an Episcopalian exercise. Okay. It was an Episcopalian exercise. Tom, Tom Wright had a lot to do with it. Okay. Beautiful piece of writing. Fabulous. But it did nothing because nothing could be done. Uh -huh. You know, uh, when you have a tsunami coming down the pike, that's a real mixture of metaphors, sorry. <laughs> when you have this tsunami of, of cultural whatever, and you have a church who, well, bless them, they don't have the apparatus spiritually, morally, theologically to sift this stuff. Mm. In, in my language, we've lost a theological anthropology. Hmm. We've lost it. It's taken 300 years to lose it. And I talk about a, a bastard stepchild of the Christian faith. Hmm. So I reluctantly, after eight years, I, I handed in my license to dear Peter, the local bishop. And I mean, we still talk. He's in Lambeth. We email. I'm trying to pray for him in Lambeth. Mm -hmm. um, do I fellowship and worship with the odd Anglican crowd? Of course I do. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a very funny place, Martin. Very funny place, globally, I mean, you know. Yeah. E ecclesiologically. Um, I know a little bit about America. I get very confused by American denominationalism. Well, we are not <laughs> without our own confusion. That would be... Except to say we are all in the hands of God. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Look, what's the book of Revelation trying to tell us? It's trying to tell us a lot of things. Yes. But, you know, he's the Lord of the church. He, he moves amongst the seven lampstands. He speaks to the churches. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Um, yeah, it's his church, Marty. Yeah. It, and he still speaks if we have ears to listen. Apparently, it's his church, mate. Apparently so. <laughs> Though a lot of people are trying to take out a franchise and take over. But anyway. Oh, 
Oh, yes. Well, it's exhausting if you do that. It is. But people love people love to try it though. You're fighting oh, against oh, a pretty oh, yeah. big. Uh, well, it's good for business though. That's the thing. You get to collect all the profits. <laughs> ah, <laughs> pass it down for nepotism. <laughs> how stupid You're of business. me not to realize this. <laughs> So when did you meet T.F. Torrance in your work? Um, first time around at Wycliffe, there's a bookshop called Blackwell's in Oxford. And um, I came across Space, Time and Incarnation, bought it. Came across God and Rationality, bought it. Uh, theology and Reconstruction was out of, out of print at that point. Theology in, in Reconciliation came out, beautiful collection of essays. So I, I, I go back to Rhodesia and I'm a curate and I have five or six of his books at that point and I buy a few more as and when they come out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm sitting there between 77 and 85 with five or six of seven of these books and, and, and they're, 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 they're grist their theological grist for my preaching. Because Jim Hickenbottom, the principal of Wycliffe, said, now look, guys, you're about to leave, you're about to be ordained, you're about to go into parish ministry, and life is hectic. But don't stop reading. Mm. That's what he said. Don't stop reading. Wonderful thing he told us. So you're preparing sermons with commentaries and stuff, but so I, I, I read. And Tom Torrance and Tom Smale and Fountain Trust and Theological Renewal, that lovely little thing which I'm trying to track down for you. Ah, these were these were just incredible oases mm. in an otherwise fairly barren desert. Um, we had other things on our plate, really, as a church. It's called a civil war. It's called independence. And then we had a genocide to deal with as well, 82 to 85. And, and, and you kind of, <clears throat> theology, it's tempting to take a back water there, you know, a, a, a back pew there. <clears throat> but something happened that I realized you've got to plug deep into these wells if you're going to survive in a desert. Mm. And, and Torrance was just a gift. You know, those, those books I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, my, my copies of them are so heavily annotated, it's, a, it's, it's obscene, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> and, and, I mean, he was, he was manner in the wilderness. Mm. So, you know. And, of course, the lovely man called William Neal, New Testament scholar came out to the University of Rhodesia, now called the University of Zimbabwe, after independence. And I, and I was an examining chaplain for a little program. They were running a diploma because I was a graduate there and they thought, you know, help use me. So they used me. I met William Neal around 1983, 84, when I was beginning to think, hey, look, I've got a few ideas that need sharpening up and focusing and mm -hmm. putting down perhaps. So when Michael Green suggests a sabbatical and how to do it, it was already forming. Mm. Why is William Neal important? Well, he's a personal friend of Tom's, isn't he? Mm. Tom Torrance. So he wrote on my behalf and I wrote a little three pager to Tom Torrance and he was so gracious. He sends me a typescript back of what in fact is a little monograph mm. in his thing on, 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 on Rana, which was dated from the mid seventies, which is the contaction of, of, of Rana's you see, which was all the buzz at that point. And it's, it's Tom Torrance's take on it. I mean, I'm sure you know it. And, and he was, I thought, oh, he doesn't know me. William Neal knows me. And here's this, 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 this man, you know, fast forward. I went to the Theology and Science uh, Association in Oxford second time around in the mm. mid-80s. 
And TF arrives one day, you see, it, it's his turn. And that's when I first met him face to face, only time I've met him face to face. Uh -huh. And I mean, what a saint. I mean, who retires from his career and goes off to China? I mean, come on. What does that tell us? Seriously, Marty. Yes. You know, what are, what are we academics doing? That's why I've never left pastoral ministry. Hmm. I, I've never been allowed to leave. It makes right. me a very bad academic, but that's fine. <laughs> or maybe it makes you a good one. Bye, Snake. It depends on what you understand the academy to be about. For is there anything you remember of T.F. Torrance in that one meeting that uh, stands out? His incredible graciousness, hmm. terrible human, you know, great humility, hmm. self-effacing. He's a giant of a human being, mm -hmm. giant of a theologian. And yet he wore it with such grace and humility. Mm. There you are. Lovely. I mean, that's just a, that's an impression. Yeah. That's what he exuded, you know? Yeah. You can still see him there, it sounds like. You can see, you still have a memory of that, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I mean, I'm stupid, right? Because I say to him, look, I've read half your books, which wasn't quite true, probably, because he's written far more than I was ever aware of. But, you know, I certainly read a good dozen of them by then. Yeah. But only a dozen. Come on. You know, what's a dozen for a man like of his opus? Idiot Bryden, you know? But there we go. <laughs> Very good. Tell us a little bit about the book and the, the metaphors you play out with the lion, the dove, and the lamb. The, you know, the title is intended to do something. You're, you're hoping a reader will see that and be intrigued. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, well, I hope it kind of goes, oh, what is this guy trying to say? <clears throat> the subtitle, of course, is The Giveaway, An Exploration. But um, I talk about that in the preface, as, you, as you've as you seen, I hope. Yeah. And the dove is the spirit, of course, and the lamb is, of course, Jesus. But not quite the lamb we think, you know, I mean... I, I grow lambs on the farm, plenty of them, right. <clears throat> you know, but <clears throat> the lion of the tribe of Judah, Judah and the lamb of God, I talk about in the book, as you see, when mm -hmm. we come to Revelation 4 and 5. And then, of course, why the lion? Well, is that the lion of Judah? Is that, you know, the, 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 the Revelation 5 stuff again? The answer is, well, it's not because I take it over from Alec Matias' little book on the Bible Speaks Today, The Message of Amos, because I taught Amos, and I had five or six commentaries. The Anchor Bible series is the best, I think. It's only 800 pages, for goodness sake. <laughs> These two guys, you know, who write it. Yes. One of them an Aussie, actually. Uh, oh. One of them's an Aussie. And And... The day of the lion, because how does the prophecy start? You know, the lion roars from Zion hmm. and the pastures of Carmel wither. Now, what's your geography like? You know, Carmel's a long way away from Zion. You know, the lion roars from yeah. Zion and the pastures hmm. of Carmel wither. And then, of course, you have the day of Yahweh, chapter 5. Mm -hmm. And you have those hymns, those three hymns, the Pleiades and Orion, and he rides the heights of heaven. And you know, Who is this Yahweh God who is a cultic, cultic deity? Mm -hmm. But you are so mucking up the festivals because you, you seek me, but you should be seeking good and letting righteousness flow and all that stuff of Amos. Mm-hmm. And of course, the word seek is absolutely paramount. It's the cultic term, as I write about in God's mm -hmm. address. Mm. It, it's code. It's code. Quick code. And, and you've probably figured, I, I, I like quick code. <laughs> Trinity is give a gift recipient. Next, what's your problem? 
<laughs> Seek is is code. You see, it's cultic code. Right. We're entering the presence of the living God, and so mm. the lion is this lion who speaks, who addresses, who sustains, and mm. mercifully redeems. Mm. He redeems Irenaeus. These two hands. Then I tweak that a little bit, as you know, at the end there of chapter three. Uh, the, the two hands diagram gets gets modified a little bit. Yeah. So that's the title. That's the title. Okay. Because for many, I, I grew up on C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia. So it's the lion and emperor over the sea, of course, there. Though in uh, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the lion becomes a lamb. So, you know, you've got Ow. transformation going on. and Lewis Symbols of... S symbols are plastic, aren't they? They are, yes. The question of how he views the spirit in those, he doesn't use a dove or an image like that in a sense. It's more breath, the breath that bears the children into Narnia uh, and all that. I think those are images of the spirit. It's, it's bellissima, as the Italians would say, when you've been <laughs> given a good food, you know? Bellissima. How many, yes. how many languages do you know? Um, that's not a fair question. Um, my French and German are so rusty, it's archaic. Uh, my Greek and Latin are rustier. My Italian is solo pochino, <laughs> which is only a little. Um, and, and but it was good. quite cute. I mean, I did go back to Germany in, in, in the mid 2000s with, with my daughter. And after four days in Berlin, I found myself able to take on the taxi drivers. So that was all right. That's good. <laughs> well, you do quote, I mean, you have words in German as you go through here. So you're you're picking up on Bart and his German in the original. So I mean, you you seem to be yeah. doing quite well with all of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, German's extraordinary. I mean, it takes one word and thrashes around with five others and comes up with something called Wissengesellschaft. I mean, for goodness sake, what the heck did you just say? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, I'd, I mean, say, I'd say you're letting language do its work in you even still, even though you may forget some things, it still has its playful way of uh, oh, yes. spilling out here and oh, there yeah. and recipes and, and such. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in your I introduction, of, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 no. That's fine. That's why, I mean, all is everything in you plays together well, so that's all fine. Um, you talk about as a boy and the whole thing of models and mo model and metaphor, in a sense, blend together in these opening pages. So there's something about the persona of who you are and the way it developed as something making models in the word, what you use as code in a sense, are those simplified models or ways to begin to begin to get a grasp of things? Is that is that kind of an insight into who you are? I mean, are we starting with the way you think about the contribution that you bring to the world? My father was a beautiful colonial Edwardian, and he never really understood me, which is fine. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my I'm response. Howard's comment there, okay. I am, I am, I am. Yep. <laughs> How else do you respond in German? When you don't speak it, you do it, you know. Um, and he called me, I mean, my three initials are ABS. And, and, and he used to call me Arthur Bryden, yes, but black, you see, because, you know, whatever's going down, I'm going yes, but. Uh-huh. And, and, and I mean, you're asking me, and I made lots of plastic models, uh, the physicality of a model, but also the conceptual ability of a model, but you need to refine models. Hypotheses need refining mm -hmm. because every piece of human knowledge is provisional. Arthur Bryden, yes, but. Uh, so I kind of slip into this stuff. Uh, so which is chicken and which is egg, I really wouldn't have a clue at this point in my life. All I know is that it seems to be quite useful 
when I'm in pastoral situations, to be very flexible with language, mm. because you're talking to a Rousey. Now, what the heck's a Rousey? You, you Americans have no idea what a Rousey is. A Rousey is a little hand in a wool shed uh, sweeping up the clippings off the sheep, which are half sheep shit and half wool. And it's the most menial job that a wool shed has to offer. And I, and I speak with Rouseys. Hmm. Of course I do. Yeah. And, and I speak with others who are in a totally different stratosphere of, 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 of humanity hmm. and a few people in between. And, and so why I'm beginning there, I'm saying, look, we need models. It's the only way humans actually can operate in, in getting a handle on hypotheses. I have a very, very, very close friend who's a mathematician, mid-70s. Oxford and Keel are his pedigree. But he's also won international awards. And mathematics, I mean, I did do quite a bit of maths at one point. Mathematics is this extraordinary language. And theorems are about quintessentially squeezing stuff. Mm. And the models do the same thing, you see. Mm -hmm. models are trying to grasp and bring coherence and and i get it i totally get it yeah so i'm i'm an idiot and saying well let's let, let's see if we can't come up with some model that gives us some apprehension and i love that difference between comprehension and apprehension oh. which is tom tom torrance mm -hmm. some apprehension of the triune deity yeah why the people of God deserve it, Marty. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you, if my preface has any traction at all about stuff of, well, we're left with this symbol and we haven't a clue of how it actually touches our lives. And then, of course, I, I, know, I know we're doing the lion, the dove and the lamb, but people who read that said, no, no, Bryden, help. You know, that's great, but help. So God's address gives a very simple series of Bible studies, finishing up with that New Testament cate catechism, which is utterly premised on baptismal theology. Mm -hmm. But that phrase, baptismal theology, will scare the pants off most sacramentalists or Baptists or evangelicals in the way that I put it all together, mm. I suspect. Because it's, it's none of that and it's all of that. You know? Why does this scare them? Oh, because you see, Baptists think they're so right, and sacramentalists think they're so right, and Pentecostals have got it nailed. And I'm silly enough to say, hey, guys, stand back a bit, look at each other, will you? Hmm. Look at each other. Listen to each other. It's multifaceted, and you think you've got the whole ring. Don't be stupid. Hmm. Sorry, that's a real mixing of metaphors, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, had, I have to hit the pause button for some people sometimes. <laughs> that's okay. It's a multifaceted. You have a, lot of, yeah. you have a lot of energy, is what I would say. I, I can't see you retiring. You have too much energy to put a cap on it. So, Well, all right. If you want to go there very quickly and briefly, for two and a half years, I, I've been very ill. Um, I'm coming good. Okay. But my feet are still shot. The nerves are dead. They're, 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 mm. they're trying to come to life. <clears throat> and I'm coming up for air now. And, and there's this institute in Auckland called Maxim Institute. And the guy that is actually staying with us here on the farm at the moment, dear, dear friend, I mean, terribly close friend, um, his pedigree is a bit, a bit like Alistair McGrath's. Mm. Uh, yeah, seriously. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. Uh, extraordinarily bright boy in his early 60s and he is going back into formation and teaching and we're together actually going to help both in australia and in new zealand I, i'm in new zealand so yes i have energy in it yeah, that's correct it's coming back okay. and thank god and apparently he's got a job for me so that's great lord what I mean, job does he have for you chef. what what job does oh. he have for you i've been on the board of maxim institute a couple of times it's a yeah. think tank, <clears throat> uh, conservative in a political sense, 
um, quite radical with some of its ideas, actually. So it's an interesting mix of things. And I'm going to go back as their chaplain, Padre, uh, having been on the board and understanding their governance and stuff. They're going through a new era, change of personnel. Terribly exciting, actually. I went up there mm. recently and had a, a session with every member of staff. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful people. Beautiful people. And they trust me. I trust them. It seems to be the gods saying, okay, let's go. Because you see, undergraduate degree, political science and theology, I straddle this crazy world that says, hey. And New Zealand right now politically is in a very, very interesting, curious, tragic, potentially weird place politically. I mean, you get you get the spin and the spiel. But the, the whole world is, is in their own ways of that kind of place of weird and... Yeah, yeah. Where is it not weird in the world right now? I no, guess, I, I guess, I, I guess you're right. <laughs> but and everything is impacting everyone else. I mean, the nature of of yes. theological thinking, where we just recognize that there's so much diversity right now that for anyone to to recognize the unified life with the particularity of life in the Trinity, to say, um, certainly in the United States, we we've lost the unity and we've devalued kind of the particularity of different people's views and so the you know when theology goes bad society goes bad and the fracturing um departs and uh, the call of trinitarian thinking i think is to recognize particularity is not a problem as long as you bring the gift of who you are and value the gift of another there's something that cohesifies as each becomes a gift to one of the other which of course your gg are giver gift receiver i mean that's a if you take that into politics and say you know what would it look like if politicians function that they they function within a a gifting environment the gift is is one to to value the dignity and worth of each human being to bring sustainability that values who they are and the idea of what it means to receive that um, is a participatory way of functioning that doesn't mean that we all have to be the same, but that uh, what it is that we are together with our differences is a beautiful kind of unity. I haven't seen governments capture that very much, but... The trouble with receptivity is that it's very vulnerable. Mm. And the trouble with even giftedness, you have to be free to be given. So I have to give myself to you guys. Mm -hmm. I've never known you, but Marty, you and I have got a bit of traction now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and you know my habits. And, and, yes, I do know Mike habits. I, I, I think I know him quite well. Mike hadn't mentioned you before. I'm going, why didn't Mike mention? And Murray Ray was a fellow student of mine with me at Otago when I did my doctorate there. And so Murray, I know fairly, yeah, yeah, I mean, Murray, I know fairly well. Yeah. Ivor Davidson, uh, you may know. I know he, of him, course, I've is, not met him though. Right. Um, I got quite close to Ivor before he left. He, he went to Aberdeen and, and um, John Webster, worked with John Webster. Um, you know, he's he, he's shifted now, but I mean, mm -hmm. he, and, and, and he's retired. He's a yeah. Scot. Scot retired in, in Scotland. Very capable yeah. theologian, Ivor. Yeah. Very capable. Yeah. So your introduction, you talk a lot about metaphors. Um, yes. And just introducing, at some level, the world of elasticity with language. I mean, I, I've kind of heard you mention this as you go along, that we can't get over interested in our language without recognizing that they're all trying to get us in their own colorful kinds of ways at reality, which when you quote McFaig, Christian theology is that of personal relation. So to say the nature of the triune God is existing in personal relation the participation of humans following Jody Ziegler is at some level to respond to 
the gift of God's uniqueness to us. Um, not that we would conform to some standard, but that we would become who we are in the dynamic of our personal relationship because of who God is. And, and I mean, McFaig, I, I, I will be ambivalent towards, to be honest. She, she's, yes, I'm just uh, quoting from you um, on page two. So I, of course you are. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm fully aware. I think she just, did she um, just die recently? I, I don't know. She I might. think she did. She might. Have. I think she was at uh, Vancouver School of Theology. I think she just died within the well, last well, couple of months. So, yeah. well, may she rest in peace. Because yeah, that's it. You know, um, Tom Torrance has some very interesting th things to say about her style of theology and her ilk in yes. God and rationality in the opening chapters. I mean, almost prescient. It's 1971, for goodness' sake, and 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 he's talking into the world of the 21st century. Fascinating, fascinating, yeah. because not all models are useful. Right. Um, some of them are downright useless. <laughs> yes. Well, Sally McFaig's and, and, models tended not to be grounded in reality so much as the models are grounded in the models themselves. Uh, nicely put, because you see, humans get too abstract. You see? Uh, oh, right. Thank you. She died in 2019. Oh. Okay, uh, there we go. <clears throat> that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. She's gone um, in any case. The, the she, world got she, put on hold for two years, so. Well, well, she obviously knows better now, you know, um, or something. Um, I'm also aware of what Wittgenstein has to teach us, uh, which is an awful lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think... Philosophical Investigations is a set text for every theologian, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really do. Because we are symbolizers, Genesis 2. He names the animals. Every culture uses language. Um, and, and, and when you start cross-fertilizing, which is a 21st century global world, whoa, look out. And, of course, we miss because a Rousey, Gumtree, all these languages that I'm using, bless you, you're North Americans, you know, you've got these funny trees, you know, these redwoods, for goodness sake, you've got redwoods, you haven't got gum trees. Yes. <laughs> Actually. Um, sequoias are threatened by the fires that we have, but anyway. I know, I know, I have, I, 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 I've, I've, I've seen that, and mm. oh dear. And I mean, the fall in America, I, which I've seen, what a beautiful thing. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Now, if that's not a theater of glory, thank you, Calvin. I mean, you know, what, what, what is? Come on, come on. It's, it's a wonder. I think that the, the fields of lupin in New Zealand have a glory yes. of their own as they, yes, they do. become yes, they the do. skirt of Mount Cook and all that. So there's something yeah, yeah. rather glorious there. Marty's talking about the center of the South Island, which is a bit of an arid desert and lupins thrive along the creeks and everything else. And they're different colors. And they and, go uh, on and on fields. It's like yeah. being in paradise. And of course the primitive um, native in inverted commas wanting to turn back the ecosystem of uh, the Europeans, they want to poison all those lupins. They do. They do. They do. Yeah. Is but that back me, they're, a bit they're, bright they're, now with the sun? Well, you Is know what? You look off? good. That's you're you're fine. Oh, okay. As long as okay. you look good, what's behind you is not is not as important. So <laughs> well the sun is now beaming through. Great. Yes. And you are beaming through as well. So that's good. So your chapter one, a fireside chat. You you appear to want, and again, I'm just trying to see your approach in this book to Trinitarian thinking and how you're inviting the reader into a journey, or as you use the word, an exploration. So your 90-year-old mother-in-law is your companion as we begin this. So you, I mean, you're sitting with somebody who's been around a few years. And you want you want them to the reader to enter into the strangeness of discussing the Trinity, 
but also the hopefulness, I would say, of what it is that the Trinity brings. Is that true? How are you inviting us into your story here? I'm, I'm saying something very intimate. Hmm. I'm saying here is a domestic scene. Hmm. Now, hopefully, people can still identify with domestic scenes. It's full of little anecdote and quip. But it's also inviting us into pretty holy territory because she's now chapter two, a widow. And I specify that. She, in fact, lived with us until she died aged 100. She was with us quite a while. Yeah. And, and that's, this was fairly early on in her time with us, after her husband had died. And I'm trying to suggest, look, this Trinity stuff has to do, has to be reflected actually in family relations. Mm. And, 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 and it's also to do with a meal. It's to do with who grabs a newspaper in the morning. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's all this stuff of, of ordinary domesticity, as well as being the most sublime reality that we will never, ever catch hold of. Even, by the way, after the eschaton. Mm -hmm. We'll never catch up with God, ever. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you know. That we all participate the, in the, the glory. Yes, yes. Hence the whole model of ecstatic epictatic, you know, when you get into chapter mm -hmm. chapter nine of, of the book. Now, so I'm kind of going, who is this wonderful woman? She's a, a very devout Irish Catholic. Her faith is pretty solid. It's not just secondhand and institutional. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. Yes, she's never been, you know, through big catechetical school or whatever. That doesn't matter. Thank God. Oops, what have I just said to a bunch of theologians? Uh, but, you know, um, and of course her retort, oh, that's just a mystery of faith, is atypical be necessary, but C, not the last word. Mm -hmm. So I'm inviting people in those two chapters into an intimacy, into a participation of domesticity, of ordinariness. Mm. Nothing is more ordinary than those two chapters, I hope. Yeah. It's a little, it, it, it's a little novel because it's an urban setting and very few people have family meals anymore and, and very few people look after their in-laws for the rest of their lives, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I get the sociology. I yeah. get it. But I'm trying to say, yeah, come with me into the intimate, into the domestic, into the ordinary. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to slip into that <laughs> this little crazy model that might just introduce you to something utterly awesome. Uh -huh. the, uh, the word just was the word that I struggled with reading with Terentian lenses to say mystery is to say you are a mystery because you are a, one who has much life that we don't know. And so the mystery of who you are is part of the intrigue of hearing your story so mystery isn't a distancing thing. It's the word mystery is an invitation to that which is full of that which could be known. And faith in a Terentian way of thinking is not merely a statement of what is known, but we just take it kind of because somebody else says so. It is in a sense science itself. Faith is the knowing of the one who wants to be known. So just seems to diminish those but the nature of your of your goal is to have mystery be more discovery and faith to be more true knowing. Can I play with you again, you see? Why did Please. I use just? I mean, it is so pathetically inadequate. It's uh -huh. not just anything. And 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 I will continue to use paradoxical language to provoke. Right. Right. That's part of what I do. I pull people's legs and they're not even aware they've lost both of them. 
and 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 that's fine. That's okay. Yeah. But the beauty, I think, of the way Torrance sets it up. Hmm. Look, we cannot know anything from a flower to soil to the cosmos to the deity without actually that reality disclosing itself to us according to itself. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, I'm paraphrasing Torrance there, of course. Mm, yeah, that's very Torrancean. You know, and 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 as as these disclosures are things we engage with, we have to stop and pause and receive and listen and observe. And in the cases of animals, be observed. And in the cases of humans, even more observation is required. I mean, a courting couple is, you know, it's quite interesting. <laughs> and then after married, of, I'm, I've been married 45 years. You know, we're still trying to figure the game out. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's what it is. Yes. Because we're slightly different and stuff is also, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And this and this deity who discloses and says, I want you. Mm. I want you. Mm -hmm. His desire for Marty is so passionate, mm. so full of energy. But also, hey Marty, cut that out, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Because he wants the best for Marty. Yes. And Marty th already thinks he knows what the best is. Mm. Oh, no, no, we haven't a clue half the time. So, oh, by the way, cut that out, please. Yes. I mean, this this, this extraordinary giving and taking and, and engage, because that's baptismal stuff. You're putting off and you're putting on. You're putting off and you're putting on. Wow. You know? Poor old, poor old Edmund gets his whole thing de-dragoned, you know. He does indeed. And I'm afraid, sorry, you and I need a lot of undragoning. Yes. <laughs> that is a good word. That's a good word. The, uh, yeah. I mean, your, your sense this book is, uh, I mean, your, your comment that you're writing an academic study of the Trinity, doesn't the academy need an undragoning as well? It isn't your book an, an attempt to undragon in a way. You do get a little bit thicker than your your language um, at some points that not not everyone would get that, and so that may still be a bit of dragon. But your your agenda is de dragoning, undragoning. However, we take the dragon out of it. Doesn't the academy I need mean to be called back in a sense to the 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 vivid life force that the Triune God brings to us and not to reduce it all to uh, arguments and models and I mean theological education I've been on the skirts of again quite a bit of my life yeah um I participated in in seminars and workshops and lectures and so on I used to lecture in Melbourne and Because the industry, and it is an industry, mm -hmm. and I've got a son-in-law who's a professional academic, has become such a financial rat race of sponsorship and funding. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and even that is only 20 years old. Maybe it was easier 25 years ago, perhaps. Certainly easier 40 years ago. Because economies, Western economies are now different things yeah and, and and when there's not a lot of disposable income what do you start chopping off you see i mean it's not very useful in inverted commas it's not very pragmatic mm. and i mean you know what's theology now you and i actually understand that a culture is so split and humans are supposed to engage in that split to heal it Mm -hmm. to be some sort of a bridge builder of the various dualisms that Torrance kind of, uh, you know, identifies. Um, the academy 
is also different in different parts of the world. Although international scholars move around and get different jobs, and we have that lovely, lovely man from Melbourne. I forget his name, sorry. Um, you know, he got up at six o'clock in the morning to do that stuff on, 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 on the, his paper on, on, on hermeneutics about two months ago. Um, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're scratching too. No, no I, I can see his face. I can see his face. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's an, I, I quote him as an example of an international scholar who's moved and so on. And, right. And, 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 and and you yourself have links back into New Zealand, and it, it's a. But I actually think we need professional theologians because guys Alan, and gals. Darren, Darren um, Sursky. That's it. Thank yeah. you. Um, because you need time to read, and you need time to digest, and you need time to spend together, rubbing each other, you know, chopping off the corners and polishing each other up. There's a huge place for the academy, technically, theoretically, hopefully. What I think we're dealing with is a cultural confusion that has so invaded also the academy. And I mean, I look at some of the stuff that some of the students in Oxford in the last two or three years have got up to. I mean, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the word. Some of the woke stuff that they're kind of campaigning on. I, I, I want to say, hey, just stop, guys and gals, stop. You've no idea what you're saying or doing here. You're too intelligent to engage with this stuff. But it's, I used to do a theology and culture unit at Maxim. Mm -hmm. And I always started with two questions. The last creature to ask questions of the water is the fish. Secondly, the first time the fish knows itself to be the creature that it is, it's when it's caught and on dry land. And these poor students would look sideways and say, who the hell is this? <laughs> but, but they got into it very quickly because cross-cultural things are fishes being caught. And we're taught mm. that we've been swimming in a cultural pond that may be mm. a bit polluted. Mm -hmm. And and hence the, the, the stop and 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 I, I, I've no idea what your institution is really or what your lovely I've friends are. I've taught in many institutions with from many pr different perspectives. I've taught in a Catholic University, Free Methodist, Lutheran, um, non-denominational, Pentecostal. Yeah. So I mean, I have a very broad. Yeah. Many many ponds. Well, hallelujah for that, because you might get a bit of a braided river as a result. Um, and you know what I mean by that metaphor. Um, the, the, the academy, we need the academy because we need professionals who have the time and society sets these people aside and pays them. Yeah. You know, um, because we need that stuff. Uh, the difficulty I have with some of the academy is it has now become so politicized in a very narrow ideological fashion that, I mean, Willie Jennings, for example, I mean, I, I listened to a YouTube thing of his yesterday and I'm going, I don't recognize this man in inverted commas that you're describing as a Western product with his three criteria and all the rest of it. I mean, it's his book after whiteness. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm, I, I just, sorry, the school I went to, the universities I went to, people, come on, that's that's not my academy. So I don't know what academy you're trying to articulate or, or dive into or reform. He, he wants to reform the academy too, doesn't he? Big time. Yeah. But so I wouldn't if if say- If we were to take your book and say, let's let's revise the academy according to a Trinitarian understanding for the good of the church especially but also for the world um how, yes. how would you reconstruct the nature of the task um of the we don't we don't want to necessarily get into all the programs though that might be implications of it but the academy right now is to train professionals to go and do a job in a particular locality largely with the function more than the content 
how would you how would you revise if we were to say let's use um bryden's book to rethink the nature of the task of the academy for the next uh, couple of decades here how how would we take your work and re-envision that's a bit of a curveball i like it <laughs> good and I just the words I reconciliation and reconceiving. I mean, chapter nine; those are your words. So, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah playing yeah, yeah. with that as well. Oh, oh, you're you're throwing the ball back at me. I love it. That's all right, Marty. Well done, you. No, no, no. That's your job, mate. That's your job. There it is. So, what have I just done? I wish you were going to answer you, haven't I? <laughs> um. It's so, it's such a scramble for a lot of academics. They have to fight for their positions. Mm -hmm. There's so much competition and dare I say it, a bit of jealousy and envy and kudos mm -hmm. at stake. And, you know, now you, you'll actually get that in a wool shed, by the way. <laughs> yes. Because it's about human nature in a fairly unredeemed set of patterns that then become habitual hmm. you know that yeah i guess your three i guess your three books might be trying to say something about that they do yes and you know these habits of ours it takes a long time to break a habit for an individual let alone for an institution mm -hmm. let me just talk about something in the past Jim Hickenbottom, principal, 1974 is when I went, left in 77. He, he went there in 71 when Wycliffe was about to be closed. Mm. And he's at Durham. And he was a man of slight stature, five foot five in, in the old language. And in three years alone, by picking his staff, and by getting rid of the dead wood, he began to reform Wycliffe. Hmm. And it's, it's, it's now one of the leading, quote unquote, evangelical Church of England seminaries. Now, I'm answering your question by saying, it always takes a lead person or lead persons who then pick a team because we can never do these things on our own. And with Maxim Institute now, it's got a particular, it, it is about to start an internship program hmm. of people, young men and women. And we have to sink our lives into them as part of what we do, mm -hmm. as well as researching particular policies that may or may not be of use for the political life of Aotearoa and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So for me, the academy is about formation in the lives through teams of people that are explicitly intergenerational, naturally intergenerational. The book, you, you talk about, you know, why do I start where I started? I mean, you can't get more intergenerational than the way I started. Mm -hmm. That says something, I hope, about the Christian faith being a traditioning body of people. Um, you know, why, why are you got a reading group of Tom Torrance? Well, Tom Torrance is a giant of Scottish theology, as well as Karl Barth and so on. Uh, you know, I don't know nearly enough about Scottish theology. Good grief, I'm totally ignorant. But I get the impression that he's written an awful lot about it and knew a lot about it. Because the Scottish way of training people was a presbyter took into his home four or five young men mm. who lived with him and saw him on the job. I'm still answering your question, brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, please don't. I, I haven't, haven't lost sight of your question. That's good. I'm, 
I'm enjoying it. You know, and 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 this little body of, of, of the Maxim Institute, we are trying to reinvent it a bit for various historical reasons over the last 15 years. And I know that history from the inside and the out. And uh, going back into it now with a view to having just a little microcosm that actually, yes, it needs to be utterly rigorous. So academic quality stuff is vital. Mm -hmm. And this friend of mine will be injecting quite a bit of that. I mean, he's a Cambridge University graduate. He's got a doctorate as well. I mean, he reads Ratzinger and Rana and Lonergan and von Balthasar and a whole lot of crew. Mm -hmm. He's one of the few people he and I can talk together and actually mm -hmm. make sense to each other. <laughs> That's your math background that as was well. <laughs> what was that, my friend? Sorry? That's your math background as well. That's a particular language. Only six, seven people know what they're talking about when they go higher and higher. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's okay. Don't forget the Rousey and the Wilshed, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, the Rousey needs food and shelter and friendship and, and, and mm -hmm. affirmation and uh, you know the the education that she mostly mostly she's hasn't received and hmm. you know i i these creatures of god that god allows to have pretty tragic short lives and i i, I thank god there's an eternity for them to actually become who they're meant to be hmm. because this life is only just the beginning and and I think I have enough evidence now to say, okay, they're dead from our point of view, and they've been utterly wasted from our point of view. Utterly wasted. Terrible, terrible word of a human being. And God says, I ain't done with them yet. Mm -hmm. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of the living. And, and all the dead in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. in eastern Ukraine, in Mariupol, Venezuela, Amazonian jungle, Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. He's not done with them. Hey, that's hope. Hope Isn't is it? good. Yes. Marty, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm... I'm uh, reading, I, I didn't have a chance to read the lamb and, and the dove and the, the lion. The lion, there. the dove and the lamb, yep. yeah. I got a, but I read God's address. I was, I was looking at that and I was really blown away by that. And uh, during his final thoughts and his conclusion there, uh, Brian, I, 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 I just quote you a couple of things you wrote and you asked for your response. Um, so the rite of baptism initiates the Eucharistic rite continues or maintains, and rightly so, since all is gracious gift, gratitude is our only due response, but only as a Eucharist too is viewed in its appropriate fullness. See, and, that, and that's where I want to underline part of our problem is that you can't detach the power of baptism, those three different aspects in which you've addressed it, where people marginalize it and slice it and dice it and, and don't allow it to be its fullness. But then you, right after that, you quote, Notably, through the T.F. Torrance quote, both sacraments must duly envelop within the dynamic field that is the Holy Trinity, the envelopment of which is better appreciated by the means of the model grace giver and recipient that I, I've been on this path and all my friends know I'm on the soapbox that eating and drinking. <laughs> preach it, brother, preach it. Well, well, that was the thing I asked Walter Brueggemann a few years ago about his answer to this comment, because you, you guys are long in the tooth. You've seen how it's developed. And the dinner party is the way we got to get back to the hospitality, like you're saying, of the minister, where you know my way of teaching, but you see my life. It, we're not allowed to see the life of these pastors, these teachers, these philosophers, or you know. And then you find out their biography, like, well, who the hell wants to follow that guy? He doesn't even know what he's talking about because he doesn't practice it. It's a, it's a theoria and praxis that's the most important. And the Lord's table is the place where the Trinity should have been developed, like John shows in his gospel. And, and um, you know, in, in your final conclusion, you got a tremendous um, point here, you know, looking at Rublev. And we've been talking a lot about Rublev the last six weeks, seven weeks. It always comes back because 
what we're longing for is to dwell in the presence of the Lord and him dwell in our midst. And he, he meets us at the dinner party. And so th this is quoting you there. Um, for one enters in this place of worship dominated by the Eucharistic cup of salvation. Just so are we invited to participate in this circle of mutual giving and receiving among the Trinitarian persons and into the embrace of God's holy, loving hospitality and worshipful contemplation and adoration, which is due human reflection. And then you quote uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 8, or 3, 18, where the glory of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord is there's freedom. And, and, and seeing that, that connects with what he's talking about in the first part of his letter in Corinthians, where surely God is among you when they're participating in their failed attempt at the Lord's Supper, the Lord should have been there. And then the unbeliever as an evangelistic event, encountering the living God through the mediatory work of our priesthood work, they should have come to the conclusion, surely God is among you. <laughs> and I, I've been waiting for a, a radical meeting of the church where we recognize surely God is among us because he moved and did something that, you know, he walking amongst the golden candlesticks and we didn't take over and we actually let him be who he is and actually be the giver and the source of what he's giving to us that we can be the recipients. But the, this, you go on of that fullness of Trinitarian mutual regard, you know, August Aquinas and bays in the radius of each person's supreme light, Richard St. Victor and the delirium of arrival of Milbank and whose embrace as host as a guest and the guest at host, Miroslav Wolf and the percretic dance of Fides and sustained convival con uh, conversational fugue of Jansen. Like that, like I, I never met Tom, but I, I had friends that were discipled by Tom and friends of his. But James Torrance told me before he died, he told me to go and start at the back end, start at the sacraments and work your way back to the Father as the means in which he reveals himself. You know, and so the dinner party and this eating and drinking together, where it's not just um, our thing, but it's a whole occasion where we're there till God is finished with us until we're too tired, we have to fall asleep. <laughs> because there's no end to the teaching. You know, because because then you'll sleep restfully because you know you're in his grace and his mercy and you receive more to equip you. You're so weighed down that you have to fall asleep there because it's too heavy what he's what he's put in your heart. Oh, Dwayne, 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 Dwayne. Hey, brother, take a virtual hug, will you? Please receive a virtual hug across the, the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll take you back to something. In 1983, my bishop asked me to go back to the church where I was a curate. And when my wife and I went back with our two young children at that point, we were the third couple under the age of 40. Okay? Now, that was just a demographic comment. There were some very beautiful, lovely people there over 40, couples, singles, whatever. But the previous priest didn't know quite what to do with them, okay? So here comes this young buck, because I'm in my mid-30s then. And what did I do? I started conversational evening coffee and dessert parties. Partly through the tennis playing that I got involved in, because I love tennis, loved it. My feet are shot, can't play it now. And we used to have tennis parties. And then three days later, we had this dessert and coffee evening in a large, large place, private residence. We finished up having these, these, these amazing sessions where it was game on. They were allowed to ask anything they wanted. For various reasons, we actually left 20 months later, as you may have picked up, we left in 1985. By which time there are 25 new families under 40, at least 20 singles under 40, mm. and I've only lost two families over 40. Mm. Now, Dwayne, how did all that happen? Over food, interchanging, vulnerability. They asked me curly questions 
And often I used to say, that's a great question. I haven't a clue where to go with that. I'm in my mid-30s. I know nothing virtually in my mid-30s. Come on. Twice the age, and I'm still going, I don't know about this stuff. <laughs> you know? I mean, you read stuff out, right? And bless you. Thank you. But wow, what is that that's actually being said? Oh, hallelujah, Lord. But, you know, this is extraordinary stuff, the living God coming among us. Well, something happened. They noticed God was there, and they said, I want a bit of the action. I want to join your church. And they did. And then my successor, who is a personal friend of mine, the vicar, who, who died very tragically recently, you know, he, he had a rheumatic heart, etc. He grew that church into the most amazing church in Harare. Oh. But it came from somewhere, didn't it? And I mean, Tim, bless him, is his name. Tim Neal finished up, you know, 20, uh, 18 years there. But then there were a bit of politics that got in the way and Mugabe wanted to kill him and various other things. I mean, oh boy, you know, sorry, this this is real stuff, Dwayne. This is real stuff. I've been in the church. I know how it is. <laughs> oh no, no, no! This is politics in Zimbabwe. He got oh, run oh, off the road three. Oh, yeah, yeah. He got run off the road by army trucks. You know, they, they wanted the man dead. Ah, so it's food. You're dead right. It's Eucharist. You're dead right. I mean, that, that Bart quote I have about grace and, and, and thunder and clapping and all that stuff, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a beautiful quote. Very short. It's straight out of church dogmatics. And, and, and when we get it, or rather when he, God, has got us, Galatians 4, 9, when you knew God, or rather are known by God. Oh, brother. And that's a Torrance type, you know, known by God. He's got Dwayne. Oh, he's got Dwayne. And brother, I've now got you and you've got me. And this will be an interesting journey of discovery over whenever, you know, whatever. Hey, hello. I have no idea who you are. Where do you live? What do you do? What about kids, cousins, uncles, aunts? CV, all that wonderful stuff, you know? Hey, I've seen your face before. Thank you very, very much for diving into God's address because some people think it's a better book. <laughs> well, I was talking with Mike Habits here about seven, eight years ago and brought up the issue. Like the thing that was never discussed is that there, I, I bet you when we see Paul and Peter, they had a Trinitarian grammar that they discussed at the table and that's what the meetings were all about. God self-revelation and, and matched with signs and wonders and the correspondence of God being there. We're missing so much because we're so detached and we live in the abstract. We don't like, you know, the mud and the muck. That's just where we're at. We're made of dirt and you add a little bit of water to that and it gets pretty messy. <laughs> you got to reshape us <laughs> to be something we're meant to be. But the, the you know, because I was struck by the formality of religion, but it was, you know, when I was in college, I realized that wearing a suit and trying to be self-righteous doesn't really help. Like, how was it that Jesus ate and drank with everybody? You know, even if you're offering fruit, how do you get the stranger, the weirdo, or the unknown to come and have dinner with you? Where Jesus had no problem. They wanted to have dinner with him. And, you know, you know, it, it didn't matter. Like, because he confronted you with who you truly were in his way that he did it. But he said, you know, go and sin no more. Like, and they were still friends after the encounter. He always left it open for more possibility. Dwayne, I'm beginning to realize that I've been very blessed by not being allowed to belong to the academy or the world or the church. But having to integrate all three in a very sloppy way because you can't really integrate it because it's made me realize what you're saying. And I've quoted the Rousey, and I can give you a whole lot more stories of, of, of the people I rub shoulders with. Because 
Bernard Lonigan stuff, you've got to actually bring right down into the supermarket and chevy it. <laughs> it's our little local die, you know. Yeah. Because you're so right. But the interesting thing I think about Jesus is, yes, he had dinner parties, but he took 12 people. He had an entourage of a whole lot more, so about 120 or whatever Luke puts together. That's his entourage. That's where he sank his life for three years. And, the, and, and they still didn't get it. I mean, Mark's gospel, they just don't get it, do they? So whatever you're going to, if you want to reform the academy, if you want to change the church, that I only see one way of trying to do that. And I've tried to practice it as a parish, full-time parish priest. Uh, I'm going back into an institution where I think we're going to practice some more of that again in a different way. But you're so right. And, and, and I have no idea what your academic context is or whatever else. I mean, I'm looking at your bookshelf and so on. Um, I don't know what leverage you have or what levers there may even be there to pull in your institution. Um, I don't know what friends you have, because you need support. You can't do this alone. Well, what, what I did was, I what what happened was, I, I was taught at Regent College, so I got a chance to meet Colin Gunton and Alan Torrance. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but what yes. happened was, Jim, you know, I listened to what Jim Houston was saying, and he said, you I know, know, Jim, I know, Jim, Well, he's a good friend of mine. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be the same. <laughs> you know, we both love the Apostle Paul, you know, but but what he said, he said was, you know, far too more than you could ever practice. And you're going to be judged for this stuff. You've got you got it. you got to you've got to absorb this material. You've got to inculcate it. You've got to practice. You've got to be this way, you know, and, and that's more substantial. So. I left the academy and I just visit and talk with all these friends of mine and I appreciate it. and I do all this self-guided tutorial work and 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 visit people over meals to talk about where I'm at and, and what's going on. But what happened was our church actually got visited by Jesus, like you were beginning at, uh, talking at the, about the beginning of the meeting, and it's no joke. And it was so funny because I told the pastor Jesus was going to visit you. I said I don't know exactly when, but he's going to come and talk to you, and because uh, this is what our church has been struggling with how to actually make the, the, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the agape, more hospitable and more allowing God's space to actually change us, <laughs> encountering us. And so the funny thing was, he, he was preaching on Revelation. That's what I told him. I, just, I started laughing hysterically. I said, you fool, you picked the wrong book. <laughs> because <laughs> depending on how you teach it, he's going he's gonna to come to you. And so it was about 10 weeks later when he was preaching on the Church of Sardis when he woke him up in the middle of the night and he said, Alan, what are you doing? This isn't your church. Exactly like you said. And then the second thing he said to him was, when you were younger, you used to pray for wisdom and guidance for, to rule over my people, you know, like Solomon or whatever. Who am I? But you don't do that anymore. You just presumptuously go and do what you think. And I didn't ask you to do that. And then the third thing was for the congregation to remember, you know, and, and no one recognizes remember, remembrance, reminder. That's the Lord's table where we claim the Lord's death and it comes again. As soon as you forget that, you forget everything, you know, and, and there, there's no other sermon that you have to preach and everything flows from the Lord's table. If you don't get the message at the Lord's table, I could spend 10,000 words like Paul says, I'd rather speak in five words, Christ crucified and resurrection, that's it. If you hear that and believe that, you understand the story. But the Lord's table is how it's portrayed and, and you take it with you wherever you go so that no matter where we go in this priesthood that we're involved in, if we have the Lord's table, we don't have to preach Christ any better. You can't preach it any better. <coughs> And so he was woken up and we were challenged, but he went back to sleep, you know, and that church is under judgment right now. And, and we were given all kinds of revelations and visits in the third heaven from some of the different prophets that were there. And, and uh, that's the problem. Like Jim used to talk about, you know, God wants to be so close to us, but we're offended by how close he really wants to be with us because we can't even handle being close to ourselves. <laughs> Whoa. 
Duane, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Jim, Jim, of course, is, is, is a real prophet. A genuine, genuine prophet. Mm -hmm. Beautiful man. I don't know if you know him, Marty. Oh, uh, Jim Houston, yeah, I know him well. He's written written uh, commendations for me, and the, his last book on child theology, I have an article on John McMurray in that book so that he asked me to write. So, yeah. Yeah, Jim's published four books in the last year and a half. <laughs> he's he's doing you know, brain surgery and the Psalms yeah. with Ruth Lockey and you know this one on child theology and stuff. And and the thing, his thing was the communion of the saints. Like he he brought all those saints back to life with his spiritual theology. That yeah. why would you neglect their experience to try and reinvent the wheel? Why are you wasting their experience? That's that's such a blessing for hundreds and hundreds of years in the church and, and wake up and yep. learn from them. Yeah. Well, that's C.S. Lewis's chronological snobbery stuff, isn't it? I mean, we, we we are so caught up by the modern and the present and the fashionable mm -hmm. and the, you know, and in the academy, you know, if you don't ride the current fashion in the academy, well, you, your funding's cut. Hmm. <laughs> well that's been my secret god provides i i've, I've been self-employed <laughs> a pizza delivery driver best job i could have ever imagined it's it's all cash and lots of money but it gives me a lot of free time but the thing is the thing that i've learned like if you're bringing food to people they're always happy to see you <laughs> like and see that's that's, pizza. The, that's the assumption that i have you know the presumption and, and presupposition i have because my whole life has been bringing food to people and they're mm. all, it doesn't matter whether it's the kids or the parents or e whether you're a drunk or a drug addict or whatever, you know, I've seen it all extremes and when it comes to delivering mm. food, they're always so happy to see you. Mm. You know, and, the, and it, I think that's something that Jesus really understood about human nature. You know, if you bring food, the people will come. Mm. Amen. It's another side of life in the Port Melbourne church, which is for another day, where I was for eight, nine years. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, our church services were two and a half hours long. The first hour was coffee and scrolls and food. That's good. Great stuff. Another, for another day, my. So there's one other line I just want you to comment on before we go, and that is, it's in your questions for reflections. Trinitarian spirituality, according to um, giver gift reception becomes in essence a question of cultivating receptivity and so there's there's a a challenge at some level there of what could be because that isn't what we're the best at maybe but say a little bit about what you mean as we think about the gift of this book and what people might might become as those who cultivate this receptivity in response to the grace given what was your what's your vision there <laughs> Marty, you're great. Thank you so much. I mean, what you're doing is you're pushing it back and you're and you're stretching me. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just inviting you to to just be yourself. Yeah, I know, I know. Thank you, thank you. I hinted at it earlier with the idea of vulnerability. Okay. Um. Whether we like it or not, <clears throat> the pond in which we've been swimming for you know a few few decades, most of us is sort of Western. I've only been to the States seven or eight times now, um, and, and 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 the States is not a homogenous place whatsoever. You know that. You know it, it is big, it's broad, it's diverse in itself. Let alone the multiculturalism of the place. Um. But Western <clears throat> has certain assumptions to it. And in one sense, Willie Jennings is onto something about post-enlightenment Westerners and so on. Receptivity means that Marty is gracious enough to flick me a paper that he's trying to edit a bit, and I just confuse the editor by giving more stuff. <laughs> but... But you see, 
that was an exercise in receptivity. Hmm. You send me something. How do I receive it? Hmm. How do I sit on it? How do I edit it? Contribute towards it? How do you then take what I send back to you? That's receptivity. Yes, you've used the language of participation, and yeah, 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 yeah. Koinonia is an extraordinary word. Mm -hmm. The koinonia of the Holy Spirit. The French have the expression, la communication de Saint-Esprit. Now, la communication in French is both communion and communication. And each is feeding back into the other. Mm -hmm. La communication, just, you know. And there's that other French phrase from Emile Durkheim, la conscience collective. Now, conscience, conscience, consciousness, moral dimension, all of that is about receptivity because mm. you're part of that. You get absorbed into that. La conscience collective. It's his elementary forms of religious life. Seminal text, incredibly important text. Now, of course, totally corrupted by the deconstructionists among us. Seriously, 100 years later. That's a piece of academic genealogy. Now, the thing that receptivity is about, the, there needs to be huge humility to receive. Mm. Because you haven't got something, and it's available for you to receive it. Mm. Going back to the Eucharist, now, I mean, in my tradition, we receive, not on the tongue like a Catholic, but with open hands, empty hands. And I've preached a whole sermon on empty hands, coming to the Eucharistic table with empty hands to be mm. fed. John 6, where else can we go? You've got the words of eternal life. We can't leave you. Mm. Um. It cult, but the practices of receptivity are, for me, the practices of stillness. I try and start the day with a hymn or two, because hymns on the classical tradition are, are, are songs of praise often, sometimes a little bit of a, a prod. Cut that out, Marty. <laughs> you know. Because of the way John Wesley writes his hymns, there's always a double-edged sword somewhere there. And, and, and receptivity cultivates that because you sit in stillness and quietness and God says, good morning. Mm -hmm. And for my friend and I this morning, he put on a kaleidoscopic piece of art mm -hmm. with the pinks. And, I'll, I'll send you a photo afterwards on Messenger. I mean, yeah. <sighs> That's receptivity, eating your porridge. Mm. And what does he give you? It's wonder and awe and a gift and mm. you're open to it. So that's how I begin to say um, that the practices of receptivity are stillness and quietness and humility and openness and allowing yourself to be known. Mm. I'm a very, very private person, actually. I don't believe it. Liked... What? I don't believe it. <laughs> well, you've been given you've been given five or seven percent, mate. <laughs> yes. Well, um, you're very full of bringing yourself to the present, so you seem to live that sense of the giftedness part of gifting yourself and your past and your words and all those things. So you are so much gift that it's hard to see the word private connected to that. Oh, mate. Oh, mate. The wells are deep. You know that. Your well is deep. Ask your spouse about it. Yeah. Hmm. That's part of the mystery that uh, is there to be discovered, right? Oh, yeah. The true oh, yeah. academic is just lives in the wonder of the mystery of one another and the God that makes us and goes with us. 
<laughs> I mean, what a gift to be prodded in the 1970s about things Trinitarian. Mm -hmm. And then what a gift to go back and study under Alistair. Mm -hmm. And even now, what a gift to be able to talk with you guys. I mean, not much interaction. Uh, hello, wavy, wavy <laughs> to all you. Um, this is recorded and people, people will be able to view it on the Torrance website as well. So what you have today Indeed. is not the full extent of the sharing of Indeed. who you are. Indeed. Indeed. No, no, no. I, I, I thank you for Ziegler. I mean, goodness me. I mean, you know, what a, what a, what lovely stuff. Yeah. He's, he's our uh, person next week. Yeah, once a month, we have a chapter out of T.F. Torrance's Space Time and the Resurrection now. So he's doing next week's chapter. So. Oh, that's, is that the final chapter? Chapter four. Chapter, no, he's in chapter four, I think. Space Time okay. and Resurrection. Okay. So, yeah. Well, I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll have to carve a space in my diary for that one. Must well, do that. Moving Must towards the ascension in the Lord's Supper and its cosmic dimensions. If it wasn't for Tom, like, that's what's helped me so much. Like, I sp I've been spending a lot of time up in that cosmic dimension, listening to what, how the supper is so much more than we could ever imagine. Yeah. And to Tom's I've never yeah, read Journey's big on the ascension, so I think that's why he wanted to do that chapter. Good. Thank you. So that's the fifth. Uh, sorry, it's your fourth and my fifth. That's right. The other thing called the dateline in between, brother. You know, they yes, have this I, pagan I've, ceremony. I've lived on lived on both sides of that line, so I <laughs> I understand that. Well, Brian, I think okay. we're going to sign off for today. We've had a delightful uh, couple hours here. Just a sample taste of all the good that is there in the book and in who mm. you are. The wells are indeed deep. But anyway, people have had a label of goodness, a ladle of joy. That's interesting. And, uh, yeah. A beginning of seeing that you're somebody who, I don't know how I, I haven't heard from you for years. Sorry. But anyway, now, now we know you exist. And so you can be part of the conversation. So, yeah. Marty, can I ask? Yeah, I just want to ask Brian a quick question. Uh, since you're Aussie and Anglican, by, do you know a gentleman by the name of Hugh Cox? Where is he, please? Um, well, the last information I have on him is uh, Sydney. He's, the, a, the he's an assistant to the, he's an assistant to the uh, bishop. Okay. I mean, I do have friends in Sydney. I knew the previous Archbishop, Philip Jensen. Yeah. Uh, because he and I were in Oxford in the 1970s together and we kept in touch. Um, yeah. I don't know too many people across the ditch. I've been back in New Zealand 20 years. Um, yeah. Hugh Cox. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't I just know. Him, he, did, he was a locum um, in uh, Grenoble, France, when my wife and I were there. And he was there for three or four months. And we got to be very good friends, very intelligent. He studied at Cambridge, he studied at Trinity in Chicago. And he's and he's been all over the place, but I just I thought perhaps thank you two had crossed paths somewhere along the line. But uh, marvelous. And he marvelous. would be what age? What age? Um, well, I'm 74, and he was already. He's probably about 10 years older than I am, I would think. Gee, so, works, gosh. Yeah, I mean, if you want to cross, I, I will, him, I see. Yeah, yeah. I I I will put out a word though, because Philip Jensen will know him well. Okay. Yeah, like I said, according sorry, sorry, to the, Peter Jensen. Peter. Yeah, the, uh, the the information online says he's assistant to the Bishop of South Sydney or something like that. So, Thank I mean, you. he's in Thank your you. your your side of the ocean there somewhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> so and I want to make one one quick comment on Alistair McGrath. Um, I did my master's at Wheaton College, and this uh, what was it eighties. Uh, when I was there, he he came in once. He was just beginning to make a name for himself. And the thing yeah. that struck me, as intelligent as he was and what he knew, he was not a very good speaker at the time. But then recently, I've been listening to him again, especially he has a, a lecture on T.F. Torrance from the book he wrote. And 
he has really, really improved. I, I was very impressed by him, but uh, I was impressed with him, even though he wasn't a good speaker, but I, I thought uh, he knew his stuff. There was no doubt about that. So, <laughs> so you were very I think, fortunate. Um, I was very blessed. You're absolutely very fortunate. But his social skills, as I tried to intimate, were a little yeah. bit raw, but in the 90s, I think he started to travel quite a bit and his public speaking and stuff really, really got brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And he I can now, very... of course, as you know, debate and discuss and, and engage. Yeah, I, I was very impressed with his work on atheism and the, uh, the yep. debates he yep. had with various atheists. And he came away. Yep. They came. He went away and they had a lot of respect for him. Even if they still mm, yeah. didn't agree with him, I I appreciated that. So yeah, yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Well, well Brian, thank you. The day is before you. May the may you rise with the sun and live in the glory yes. of all God has for you this day. And we just with gratitude thank you for taking time to get up early no, no, and no, no, uh, no. to spend this time yes. with us. Yes. Absolute Very pleasure. So. Absolute pleasure. And please thank come you. back again and and speak with oh, us. Oh well, Enjoy I mean that's very much. that's not. Well, that's not up to me. <laughs> well, I, will, maybe. I will hopefully make make time next week because Ziegler's work I'm 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 intrigued by. Okay. Very good. 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 Okay. Many blessings on you.